Later this year, the reform movement's publishing house, the CCAR Press, will release a new social justice Torah commentary. I was approached by the editor, Rabbi Barry Block, to co-author the article on this week's Torah portion, along with my friend and classmate, Rabbi Emily Langowitz. Our parsha, Mishpatim, contains numerous laws that provide a basis for our Jewish understanding of justice. But there is one commandment that stood out, which Rabbi Block hoped we would write. A small segment of verses from Mishpatim serve as the foundation for the Jewish understandings of the issues surrounding abortion. Rabbi Langowitz was approached because her rabbinical school thesis was on new Jewish theologies of reproductive choice. Rabbi Block came to me because he had heard a sermon I gave here in 2018 explaining my lifelong commitment to choice. Rabbi Langowitz and I were excited to collaborate, and I am honored that our work will appear in this important book for our movement and the Jewish world. In our studies and preparations, I came to understand a certain discomfort I had felt for a long time, but which I had not previously found words to express. I had often used the text from Mishpatim to teach that Jewish tradition permits, or indeed even requires, abortion in a case where a mother's life is threatened. I had used the rabbinic texts that build on that, those biblical verses to explain the Jewish view that life does not fully begin until birth and that while the life of the fetus is valued, the mother's life always takes precedence. But I have come to feel that these texts are also insufficient. Before I went to rabbinical school, I worked at a, as an organizer at an interfaith pro-choice advocacy organization called the Religious Coalition for Reproductive Choice. There was a phrase that I heard activists use in that work. It was coined by Bill Clinton, who said that abortion should be legal, safe, and rare. This phrase was, for a time, a rallying cry of the pro-choice advocates that united dis disparate groups in the movement. But already, by the time I was at RCRC in the mid-2000s, it was falling out of use. And I think perhaps for the same reason that I was growing dissatisfied with the Jewish texts I had inherited on this topic. Both implied that abortion was permissible, but also framed it as morally unfortunate. Both Bill Clinton's phrase and the Jewish texts I've been teaching treat abortion as a necessary evil. They prescribe abortion rights while contributing to the stigmatization of the procedure. But here's the thing. Abortion is not rare. One in four Americans who can get pregnant will terminate a pregnancy by the age of 45. These traditions that call us to understand abortion as something that can or should only happen in the rarest cases ignore the reality that every one of our family's stories has been touched by this topic. And so I have been searching for Jewish frameworks to understand this issue that are more expansive, more compassionate, more loving. I want to open up discussions about reproductive choice that affirm our power as moral decision makers that see the ability to make choices as a reflection of the divine. I want a theology of choice that looks at our best, um, at our best faith efforts to make the right choice for us, for future generations, for our families and our world, and lifts those choices up instead of diminishing them. I want a theology of choice that takes us beyond a discussion about permissibility into a realm of sacred stories. And I hope our article is one step in that direction. If you are interested in exploring the texts that serve as the starting place for this conversation, I invite you to join Rabbi Silk and me for Gems of Torah tomorrow morning at 9.15, where we will be digging into them more deeply. And it is my hope that this Shabbat will be a part of an ongoing conversation what I have come to be able to articulate through my study with Rabbi Langowitz is that these texts are, in, are necessary but insufficient. They are a starting place, but the conversation cannot end there. With that in mind, I want to share with you for the first time publicly an adapted version of the article we wrote, which is called Stricken from the Text, Mishpatim and Sacred Stories of Reproductive Justice. In 1952, my grandmother Audrey would have been about 20 years old. Recently married, she and her husband were planning to begin having children in a few years after he graduated from college in Connecticut. But as the Yiddish proverb says, people plan and God laughs. Audrey soon became pregnant. A few weeks later, however, the joyous laughter was drained from this pregnancy when she contracted German measles. Her doctor warned her that the fetus was at great risk for congenital rubella syndrome, and that even if it survived to term, it would likely suffer severe, severe birth defects. 
The doctor and all of his colleagues urged her to seek an abortion, though such a procedure was illegal. Audrey and her husband were young, scared, and far away from their family support system as they struggled with what to do. And yet they were also lucky to have means and connections. Someone recommended they travel to see a friendly doctor in Boston who helped them find certainty. Even almost 70 years later, Audrey can still hear him saying, if you were my daughter, I would not let you carry this pregnancy to term. He admitted her to the hospital and wrote on her chart that she had come for a DNC after a miscarriage to hide their illegal act. Audrey remembers at the time being terrified of the procedure itself, of the illegality of it, and mostly of the thought that she might never be able to have children afterwards. Yet now, looking back, she remarks that she has never once regretted her decision. She did what she knew was right for her. She consulted her doctor, her husband, her God, and she made her responsible choice. A study by the Pew Research Center found that 83% of American Jews say that abortion should be legal in all or most cases. American Jews' widespread support uh, for permissive abortion laws finds grounding in the Jewish tradition's approach to pregnancy and its end. Though the Torah makes no specific reference to any process resembling a modern abortion, the following passage from Parshat Mishpatim provides our tradition's earliest guidance on the termination of a pregnancy. It says, when two or more parties fight and one of them pushes a pregnant woman and a miscarriage results but no other damage ensues, the one responsible shall be fined according to the woman's husband may exact the payment to be based on reckoning. But if other damage ensues, the penalty shall be a life for a life, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, hand for a hand, and so on. The passage contrasts two scenarios in which two men are fighting and accidentally strike a nearby pregnant woman. The permutations differ only in who or what is harmed. In the first, only the fetus is lost and the punishment is a monetary fine. In the second, the woman herself is harmed or killed. There, the punishment is re retributive. An eye for an eye, nefesh, literally soul, but in this case meaning a human life uh, possessing personhood for a nefesh. From this, we may derive the principle that a woman has the full status of person, nefesh, while the fetus, though valued, has a lesser status. The Mishnah expands this understanding of differential value by stating that if a woman's life is threatened in childbirth, the fetus inside her can be destroyed even to the point of, quote, taking it out limb from limb for her life comes before the fetus's life. Through this graphic language of the text, the Mishnahic author leaves no ambiguity as to whose life takes precedence. This text sets the standard from which other halakha or Jewish law on abortion flows. Later commentators debate in great detail the implications of this text, particularly the breadth or narrowness of the definition of a threat to a life of a woman. Some are more permissive of a range of emotional as well as physical impacts that could justify an abortion, while others understand the instances of permissibility with excruciating parsimony. Still, from the outset, Judaism can imagine some instances where an abortion would be permitted and even required. Furthermore, the Gemara concludes that prior to 40 days, a fetus is not a person, but rather considered mere water. The debates about abortion in America hinge on a question related to what constitutes personhood and when life begins. But these are religious and spiritual questions about which people of faith and conviction can disagree. The Supreme Court held in Roe v. Wade that abortion is protected under the Constitution's Fourth Amendment, which guarantees a right to privacy, including a right to private medical procedures. For American Jews, the protection of access to abortion could also be understood under the First Amendment's free exercise of religion clause. Because Jewish law permits abortion under certain circumstances as morally acceptable, or even in some cases a halachic requirement, any law that limits a woman's right to choose might limit a Jewish woman's ability to make decisions in accordance with her religious beliefs. When people of faith seek to adopt laws asserting when life begins, they endeavor to enshrine their own religious understandings into law. In civic discourse, the fact that Judaism understands these issues differently can be a powerful antidote to the pervasive sense that religious voices are only to be found on one side of this debate. Judaism is unequivocally pro-life in that it values life in all forms, both actualized and potential. But where that term has come to mean anti-abortion, then it is clear that Judaism allows for abortion under at least some circumstances and therefore calls us to advocate for civil laws that protect a woman's right to access abortion services. 
These texts and their subsequent interpretations are a vital resource for all of us who seek to affirm Jewish support for choice. And yet, we are called to go further. The law is only one facet of a full and holistic justice. Even as Parshat Mishpatim guides us to a pro-choice-oriented understanding of abortion law, it also leaves us with an injustice of a silenced story. The text in Exodus 21 begins with an act of violence perpetrated against a pregnant woman. And yet this woman is all but absent from subsequent conversations about the passage. Across the centuries, almost all of the voices of Jewish interpretation and even many modern commentators fail to acknowledge her story. The interpreters miss the opportunity to see her as subject rather than object. To see the woman in this text as merely a hypothetical and illegal case is to deny that cases such as these were very real to the people who experienced them. To reach a full sense of justice in our understanding of abortion, we must pair mishpatim, laws, with sipurim, stories. We cannot go back in time and ask this woman how she experienced the day her pregnancy ended so abruptly. But Judaism gives us plenty of precedent to offer this woman and all those who live through challenging or stigmatized reproductive experiences the power of our curiosity and our questions. How might we ask this text something new? What might we gain by looking into it not just for legal precedent but for narrative as well? Discussions of abortion so often center on the personhood of the fetus. This approach allows us to elevate the personhood of the one carrying the pregnancy. To achieve the justice owed this woman hearing the truth of her story, we might ask her, who are you? What was your name and your life story? What circumstances brought you into such close proximity with this fight? If you survive, what will you tell your other children about the day you lost your pregnancy? What was your relationship to the pregnancy you carried, and what value did you assign to its loss? Our tradition offers techniques we can employ to reveal the answers. First, we can look for parallel texts within the Torah to give this woman's story greater context. There's a nearly identical case of two men fighting near a woman in Deuteronomy 25. In that episode, a woman attempts to break up a fight between her husband and another man. In the process, she accidentally touches the other man and is sentenced to having the offending hand cut off. The woman of our verse in Mishpatim might well have known of such punishment. Picture the terror she would have felt, knowing that any action she took could end in violence. If she chose to intervene or not, if she knew the men or not, in any scenario she risks losing her hand, her pregnancy, or even her life. Even in the 21st century, we live in a society in which pregnant women find their choices restricted by the violence of the men around them. When we read these passages from Exodus and Deuteronomy in tandem, we see beyond the permission for reproductive choice to the structures in society that must be healed to make such choices real. A second way to give the woman of Mishpatim greater voice and agency is to turn to Midrash. No traditional midrash gives greater insight into this woman's story, and so we are called to create our own. We might be aided in this endeavor by a final technique for bringing fuller justice to this narrative. We can ask this woman of the Torah for the truth. We cannot ask this woman of the Torah for the truth of her experience, but we can come to a better understanding of it by asking those in the present day whose own stories could help uncover that which is hidden in this text. Every family has stories of reproductive choices. Some are shared between mothers and daughters, between parents and children. Others are kept secret and lost. Our work of justice is rooted in the telling of these stories. For every woman caught in a fight between two men, there was one miscarrying at home and one in a strange land, one in a happy marriage and one whose relationship was violent, one alone and one surrounded by her family, one desperately wanting to save the fetus and one desperately wanting it gone. Every pregnancy has its own story with its own ending. Each time we listen with compassion and curiosity to a new narrative, we strengthen our ability to discuss pregnancy and its termination without judgment, guided by the voices of those who have actually experienced it. Sharing these stories has the power to lift up marginalized voices and create public empathy and awareness. For me, as an activist and advocate, these stories I read alongside our ancient texts and which I view as equally sacred inspire my passion for justice. 
Telling my grandmother's story compels me to work towards a world in which abortion might be legal, accessible, and destigmatized. Justice for all who carry such stories, whether spoken or unspoken, must be reflected in our laws and our culture. This text in Mishpatim gives us a blueprint for those laws. The personal narrative it omits calls us towards creating a more just culture, one in which we see the humanity of all those who choose to end a pregnancy. Shabbat Shalom. <laughs>